Greetings and welcome back to room 303 of the Harvard Classics Lectures. We are in lecture 108. This is Walden chapter 9, The Ponds. Now, uh, there's always a debate about what is your favorite chapter from Walden, and it's interesting that especially the naturalists, readers of this uh, poem, I call it a poem, a prose poem, um, often are really drawn to this uh, to this chapter uh, 9. Now, if you'll think about it, with 18 chapters in Walden, we really are now in the heart, if you will, the center, to use the language of the ponds, in the eye of Walden itself. And we'll hear more about how Walden, the pond, is kind of like an eye. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net uh, in the Harvard Classics folder, lectures 99 through 107, as well as the junior folder, where we've given quite a few lectures on, uh, on Thoreau as well. We're also assuming that you're conversant with our three levels of reading. At level one, what does the text say? At level two, what does the text mean? Themes, messages to a rhetoric in terms of uh, to be, not what Thoreau says, but how he says it. And uh, uh, when we're looking at things like this, like even in this chapter, I just mentioned it, the symbolism, the metaphor, the figurative language are all going to be really, truly compelling. And then finally, at level three, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way at 3A? to other chapters of Walden as well as other texts that we know, and then finally, how can I relate to this stuff personally? That obviously is the ultimate, ultimate challenge. I've already said that especially naturalists love this chapter and they are very attracted to this chapter, and I'm hoping that I can maybe share some of the reasons why that's the case. The other assumption is that you're familiar with in 303 what we call our big five. What does this chapter say about epistemology, what you can know, ontology, who you are, psychology, the study of the individual mind, ontolo or, uh, sociology, the study of the group of minds, and then finally the question of theodicy, that is to say, uh, why is there pain, why is there suffering in this world, and can we find any meaning for it? Now, when we look at Thoreau as naturalist, we're going to call him naturalist backslash or hyphen artist because I really feel like that's the way we have to approach it. I think it's a misreading of Thoreau and of Walden to simply call him a naturalist. He's far more than that. I mean, it's not just what some have pejoratively called a tree hugger. Um, he's far more than that, and I, and I hope that a chapter like this will show that. He mentions one time how, how to begin this chapter. I'm actually going to begin this chapter... Um, with the last line of this chapter. But I'm very interested in the idea of uh, Thoreau as an uh, artist. He mentions Michelangelo in this chapter, and I think that's um, significant. Um, and, and he finishes with this line, so we'll, we'll do a quick summary, but talk of heaven, ye disgrace earth. And I think that line alone really cuts to the heart of what we mean when we talk about Thoreau as naturalist, a uh, thinker that transcends, obviously, some celebration only of the, uh, of the earth or of heaven. There has to be some balance between the two. Let's do a real quick summary of, of uh, chapter 9. Well, he, he will say, since the previous chapter was a discussion of the village, now he's ready to, um, in the opening lines, he says... Um, um, to talk about these ramblings further westward into yet more unfrequented parts of the town, end quote. Now, he says that throughout all of, uh, of, th throughout all of uh, uh, Walden, the west is always going to represent something unknown, the chaos, the unexplored, and yet the long to be explored, obviously the wild, and of course as well, the west always represents those psychological, inner, um, emotive, and spiritual understandings. Of course, in Walden, we're going to explore all of these different regions through, obviously, the study of the pond. In many ways, if Walden is the name of the text and Walden is the name of the pond, this really is the heart of Walden because here he's going to spend quite a bit of time talking specifically about the pond. Now, there are people who really dislike this chapter because there's way too much detail, they will argue. I would make the counter-argument. 
What Thoreau shows us is his capacity to be an observer, a watcher, a looker, and he sees often what just a cursory view of Walden Pond might miss. I, I, I think that's true. He will speak of fishing on the pond by moonlight, which is something he loves to do, and of course his mind will at that time find its way into any kind of interesting philosophic and universal, he will call them, realms. And then all of a sudden, the jerk of a fish on his line, and it brings him back to the reality of nature. So notice, as we have said in earlier lectures, this dancing between Scylla and Charybdis, as we've commented already, or making it between the yin and the yang of Taoist uh, philosophy, this is again going to be represented. He will talk about concrete reality and, of course, the spiritual element as these opposing, contrastive, and yet somehow integrated forces. Now, go back and take a look at our lectures, especially on Plato's Republic and especially Book 6 and Book 7 and the notion of what we call in 303 that two-box theory, where in the first box we put all things physical, in the second box we put all things metaphysical. Yes, of course, we can talk about a beautiful body in the first box, but in the second box we have to put the concept of beauty. Of course, we're going to play the same game when we talk about Walden Pond. We obviously put Walden Pond as an entity in the first box because it, you can see it, you can swim in it, etc. But there's something profound about the second box for Thoreau and Walden, the pond, right? And so he's going to talk a lot about the connections between the two. He will suggest that through this life that he lived at the pond, that he found some way to bring the, the force of the metaphysical and the, and the physical together. And I think this is why Walden has a text, I call it a poem, a prose poem. I think this is why it resonates so much with, with students as they read it. Um, Walden, he says, is um, here presented in a number of ways that ultimately will become metaphoric, figurative, we might say, right? Now, he'll begin by talking about the pond. Is it bottomless? Is it not? Of course, he could see this as evidence of what, you know, the universe, the mysteries of the universe, the, um, the, the enigmas of the universe, we might say. He calls the pond the Earth's eye. He says, as the Earth's eye through which the, quote, beholder measures the depth of his own nature, obviously, he's talking about himself as well, no question. He says as a quote-unquote perfect forest mirror, he says, on a September, an October day, Walden is, quote, a field of water that will, quote, betray the spirit that is in the air, continually receiving new life and motion from above. In other words, a conduit, we might say, between the divine and the beholder, or the one watching, right, embodying somehow the workings of deity, stimulating, of course, uh, the, the, the Thoreau's own uh, ability to receive and to process all of the information that's coming. He speaks of Walden as ancient. He talks about it being there before the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. So he's tracking us back through, of course, Milton's Paradise Lost to take us back to the Genesis 3 story. We've obviously given lectures on that Genesis 3 as well as Milton's Paradise Lost. At the same time, the irony of all ironies is that while Walden is incredibly old, it's also unbelievably young. Every year, the, the, the pond evinces uh, its cyclical nature. Of course, there's a certain kind of innocence that's associated with the pond. Immediately we think of William Blake's Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience, and the dance that he plays. We've given lectures on that as well. Of course, Walden, it, it's, its waters, transparent, pure, Obviously, they're going to serve as somehow an ability to awaken. We might even say revelation of a kind. Obviously, we're going to talk a whole lot about vision. Perspicacity will be our word from our Plato study. Insight, we might say, right? Finally, Thoreau will refer to people who want to maybe bring water out of Walden, pipe it back into the town, and, you know, he's obviously got some problems with this, as well as the idea of, the, that the railroad and obviously the woodcutters have jacked up some of what the, used to be the forest around Walden. In other words, before the term ecology existed, we have in Thoreau a, a classic thinker of we need to think through what we're doing as we put our footprint on the planet. And uh, of course, this is part of it. And yet somehow he continues to argue the pond 
it, it's going to last. It's going to find its way. It's, it, it, it will be, in some ways, eternal. It will endure despite all of humans' activities, obviously, on the pond as well as around the pond. And then finally in this chapter, he will write of the other ponds, which is why I think it's significant to point out that it's not pond, which would be, of course, Walden. Notice the title of this poem is not Walden's, but rather Walden. And yet, many readers have pointed out, if you're going to call this chapter ponds, you probably should call Walden Walden's, because there's more than one. There's obviously the Walden we see, and then obviously there's that second Walden of the second box. Well, in this case, we're even going to look at other actual ponds and he'll, he'll talk about any one of these um, from his lake country right now. Obviously, when he talks about the lake country, he's referencing the poets and philosophers that were very influential for him from England, of course, Coleridge and Wordsworth. We've given all kinds of lectures on both of those cats. Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, of course, is Coleridge's classic and Kubla Khan. And then Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey. The world is too much with us as well, right? He talks about Goose Pond. He talks about Flint Pond. He talks about Fair Haven. He talks about... Um, Sunbury River, he talks about White Pond, which is, he calls it Walden's lesser twin. And finally, he finishes, um, yeah, almost in a critical way, you know, commenting that humans don't really appreciate these ponds, and by extension, obviously, nature. But like Walden, nature always thrives, right? Especially because nature is somehow absent the whole footprint of towns, villages, and the like. Now, as I've said about so many of these chapters, and I really, guys, I would really love to be able to read all of this chapter. It is one of my favorites. I think, I think Thoreau is at his strongest, at his best in Ponds, which I know shocks some of you because you read it and you're like, really? I mean, it's just too much description for me. But I think a lot of it is Thoreau showing us how to awaken. You know how he said in chapter 2, we must learn to reawaken and keep our saves awake, not by mechanical aids. I think this is what, he, what he's gesturing at. You know, if you really want to awaken, You've got to be able to learn how to see, how to look, how to pay attention. He says it this way. Sometimes, having had a surfeit of human society and gossip and worn out all my village friends, I rambled, I love that verb, right? Rambled still further westward than I habitually dwell into yet more unfrequented parts of the town to fresh woods and pastures new or while the sun was setting, made my supper of huckleberries and blueberries on Fairhaven Hill and laid up a store for several days. A few lines later, as long as eternal justice reigns, and the eternal justice is both capitalized, so we're immediately thinking of our Plato. The Republic, of course, is an attempt to define justice, remember. As long as eternal justice reigns, not one innocent huckleberry can be transported thither from the country's hills. He makes the observation, you can't really take the huckleberry out of nature and enjoy it the same way. He says, if you really want to eat huckleberry, you got to go to the source you got to go to the fountainhead. you got to go to the woods and eat it there. He says a few lines later, In warm evenings, I frequently sat in the boat playing the flute on Walden Pond and saw the perch, which I seemed to have charmed, hovering around me in the moon traveling over the ribbed bottom, which was stewed with the wrecks of the forest. Formerly, I had come to this pond adventurously from time to time in dark summer nights with a companion and making a fire close to the water's edge, which we thought attracted the fishes. We caught pouts with a bunch of worms strung on a thread. And when we are dead, and when we had done, far in the night, threw the burning brands high into the air like sky rockets, which coming down into the pond were quenched with a loud hissing, and we were suddenly groping in total darkness. Through this, whistling a tune, we took our way to the haunts of men again. But now, I had made my home by the shore. Well, this is one of those classic moments for Thoreau where he will play the game of a memory of an earlier time in his life, but it's, it's working at multiple levels. In other words, in some really profound ways, he has been fishing in this poem, trying to figure it out, and then, of course, allowing for the fireworks to go off and then trying to find his way back in the dark. Remember what he said in the last uh, chapters about being lost. Finally, he says about uh, the fishing experience a few lines later. At least, you slowly raise, pulling hand over hand, some horned pouts squeaking and squirming to the upper air. It was very queer, especially in dark nights, when your thoughts had wandered to vast and cosmogonical themes in other spheres, to feel this faint jerk 
which came to interrupt your dreams and link you to nature again. Now this notion of whether uh, the lives we live are dreams or reality, Thoreau's obviously playing games with that one as well. And he says, while I'm fishing, I'm kind of musing, and all of a sudden I'm jerked, my line is jerked by a caught fish, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm brought back again to the world of nature. It seemed as if I might next cast my line upward into the air, as well as downward into this element which was scarcely more dense. Thus I caught two fishes, as it were, with one hook. Now I think that's not, throw, that's not a throwaway line. Caught two fishes with one hook. In other words, Thoreau's constantly reminding us that we're always looking in two directions when we are in nature and when we're living in this world. He says about the water now of the pond, he says, all our Concord waters have two colors at least, one when viewed at a distance and another more proper close at hand. Well, of course, this is true about anything. I would say this is true of this poem as well. And if we're doing anything in our discussions with you about this poem, it is to try to see, help you see the multiple Waldens that, of course, I believe Thoreau wanted us to see in that process of awakening. He talks about Walden. He says it's blue at one time, green at another, even from the same point of view. He says, lying between the earth and the heavens, it partakes of the color of both. Viewed from a hilltop, we're back to, of course, guys like Swift, who will constantly talk. Think about what we say about Swift in Gulliver's Travels. It's all about perspective, right? It's all about vantage point. Viewed from a hilltop, Walden reflects the color of the sky, but near at hand, it's of a yellowish tint. Next to the shore, where you can see the sand, then a light green, which gradually deepens to a uniform dark green in the body of the pond. A few lines later, he says it this way, how large a body of Walden water would be required to reflect a green tint I have never proved. The water of our river is black or very dark brown to one looking directly down on it, and like that of most ponds, imparts to the body of one bathing in it a yellowish tinge. But this water is such is, it is of such crystalline purity that the body of the bather appears to be an alabaster whiteness still more unnatural, which, as the limbs are magnified and distorted withal, produces a monstrous effect, making fit studies for a Michelangelo. Now, I don't think this is a, a, a throwaway line that he mentions Michelangelo, the great uh, uh, artist, the great poet, the great seer, uh, uh, of course, the, the Sistine comes to mind immediately, as do all of his sculptures as well. And then he says it this way, the water is so transparent that the bottom can easily be discerned at the depth of 25 or 30 feet. Paddling over it, you may see many feet beneath the surface, the schools of perch and shiners, perhaps only an inch long, yet the former easily distinguished by their traverse bars, and you think that they must be aesthetic fish to find a substance, a, a subsistence there. Uh, he says um, a few lines later, we have another pond just like this, white pond, in a nine acre corner about two and a half miles westerly. But though I am acquainted with most of the ponds within a dozen miles of the center, I do not know a third of this pure and well liked character. Successive nations perchance have drank at, admired, and fathomed it, passed away, and still its water is green and pellucid as ever. Not an intermeeting spring. Perhaps on that spring morning when Adam and Eve were driven out of Eden, Walden Pond was already in existence, and even then breaking up in a gentle spring rain, accompanied with mist and a southerly wind, and covered with myriads of ducks and geese, which had not heard of the fall, when still such pure lakes sufficed them. Now, I think borrowing heavily from uh, our reading of Rousseau, we're playing very interesting games, or obviously Milton as well. Now we pointed out the Genesis 3 account does not use the term fall or sin for that matter, and yet obviously in Christian Augustinian theology, as we've said in other lectures, the fall is of course what's going on and understood uh, at the very beginning, the loss of Eden, paradise lost. And yet notice here, the idea is that Walden Pond is pure, what it must have been like before the fall. In other words, the innocence of it all. He continues, yet perchance the first who came to this well, he calls it a well now, have left some trace of their footsteps. I've been surprised to detect encircling the pond, even where a thick wood has just been cut down on the shore, a narrow, a narrow shelf-like path in the steep hillside, alternately rising and falling, approaching and receding from the water's edge, 
as old probably as the race of man here, worn by the feet of some aboriginal hunters and still from time to time unwittingly trodden by the present occupants of the land. This is particularly distinct to one standing on the middle of the pond in winter, just after a light snow has fallen, appearing as a clear, undulating white line, unobscured by weeds, weeds and twigs, and very obvious a quarter of a mile off in many places, where in summer it's hardly distinguishable close at hand. The snow reprints it, as it were, in clear, white type, alto relievio, the ornamented grounds of villas which will one day be built here, may still preserve some trace of this. Two observations. He says, there have been people coming to this pond long, long before us, and they even left trails to prove it. This, is, this will remind us, of course, of that symbolic reading from Longfellow's Psalm of Life. Uh, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. That notion that there is a history all of nature has a history, and even though it's very young, it's also very old. And then the second observation is, notice he says, someday all of this will be filled with villas and people living around it, which is, of course, a kind of sad realization as well. Just a few paragraphs later, <clears throat> he talks about the naming of Walden. Why the name of Walden? And, of course, I think there's a couple of important observations. I mean, why are towns named towns, right? Worland is named after a famous person that none of you really know about anymore. It was kind of really sad and tragic. Why is Walden named Walden? Some have been puzzled to tell how the shore became so regularly paved. My townsmen have all heard the tradition. The oldest people tell me that they heard it in their youth that anciently the Indians were holding a powwow upon a hill here which rose as high into the heavens as the pond now sinks deep into the earth. And they used much profanity as the story goes, though this vice is one of which the Indians were never guilty. And while they were thus engaged, the hill shook and suddenly sank. And only one old squaw named Walden escaped and from her the pond was named. It's been, he continues, conjectured that when the hill shook, these stones rolled down inside and became the present shore. It's very certain at any rate that once there was no pond here and now there is one. And this Indian fable does not in any respect conflict with the account of that ancient settler whom I mentioned, who remembers so well when he first came here with his divining rod, saw a thin vapor rising from the sward, and the hazel pointed steadily downward, and he concluded to dig a well here.